Okay, guys, how are we doing? Today's lesson is going to be on putting together the aggregates model. I know in class recently, we just started talking about aggregate demand and aggregate supply, both in the short and the long run. Uh, for today, we're going to put all of them together. We're going to talk a little bit about gaps. Uh, we're going to discuss the long run adjustment in the economy. And then we're going to talk about how economic growth happens. So there's five things that we're going to cover today. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to them pretty quickly. Won't keep too long. We'll get right to it. Uh, so here we go. Uh, first thing I want to do is I want to recap real quick the shifters of aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Uh, we know that aggregate demand from what we talked about in class is everything that makes up of GDP. So it's consumer spending, investment spending, government spending, and net exports. If any of those components are impacted, that is 100% going to be um, aggregate demand related and government spending as well. I apologize. Okay. Now, for shifters of aggregate supply, there are three things that we're going to see, okay, that are going to uh, change aggregate supply. The first, okay, is what? It's a change in resource prices. So if anything happens with resources availability, the price of resources, that's going to impact supply. The second thing is, is changes in the actions of the government. Typically, this means taxes or any type of regulatory impact. Uh, on business itself that would increase the cost of production, and then changes in productivity. Typically, we see changes in productivity in a positive way, right? Uh, companies over time find ways to cut down costs and increase output uh, by scaling through economies of scale. Uh, and so as a result, that means they become more productive and the price drops so we can supply more, right? So that's kind of how we're gonna put micro and macro together. These are the shifters of the aggregate supply and aggregate demand curves. So now let's put it all together on the same graph, okay? So we know that we have aggregate supply that slopes up toward to the right. Remember, this is our short run aggregate supply. And then we have our aggregate demand curve, which slopes down to the right. Where they combine, okay, that gives us our equilibrium. So if we're looking at the aggregates model right now, the curve that we're looking at does not have the long run um, aggregate supply curve. So, we know that at this state of equilibrium, that our price level is going to show up on the vertical axis and our quantity or output is going to show up on the horizontal axis. Now, when we add the long run aggregate supply curve into it, this is what we're looking at, okay? Now, typically when we look at the aggregates model, you're always going to have all three curves on the graph at a time. And so I will go over all three with them real quick. Aggregate demand, that's just the components of GDP. We know that beating a dead horse, don't need to continue with that. Aggregate supply is the supply of all goods and services in the short run, okay, in our economy currently. Remember, what differentiates the short run aggregate supply curve from the long run aggregate supply curve is that typically in the short run, we don't see a wage or a resource adjustment in price um, because of contracts and things like that. Like we spoke about in class, uh, both wages and resource prices are stickier, okay, than that of price level. And so it doesn't fluctuate as much. It takes time for that to happen. Now, the long run aggregate supply curve represents the supply or of or the potential output in our economy at full employment. So where it says Q sub Y, typically we're gonna look at that as Q or Y sub F, okay, when we put that on our graphs. Um, Q sub Y for the sake of, of this PowerPoint works as well. All right, and we know that if our economy is producing at its full potential and we are at maximum employment, which means we're between that four to 6% range, okay, that this is where we should be producing. This is the output that we should have or the GDP that we should be at, all right? Now, when we look at this model, a couple of things we have to understand. We are not always going to be in what this is, and this is called long run macroeconomic equilibrium. So if you're in long run macroeconomic equilibrium, you are producing at full employment or on the long run aggregate supply curve. However, the economy can be in one of three states at any specific time. If our equilibrium point is to the left of the LRAS, okay, that means that we are in a what we call a recessionary gap because we are producing below our potential. And if the equilibrium point is to the right of LRAS, that means we are an inflationary gap because it means we're technically outproducing what we should be. It means we're overemployed and resource prices are getting expensive uh, and price levels increasing. OK, 
Okay, so we're going to talk about that later, but that's what we're looking at. So this is long run macroeconomic equilibrium. All right. So first question you're going to be posed with is this: If there is an increase in consumer spending, so all of a sudden we go home and everybody at home decides that we're going to spend 20% more of our income uh, for the next three weeks, excuse me, next three months. Okay, what's going to happen in our economy? Well, we want to know. Well, what's going to happen to price level? And then at the same time, well, what's going to happen to output and which curve is going to move? So we know that there's an increase in consumer spending. Consumer spending is a component of aggregate demand. So we know that aggregate demand is going to be shifted in this case. And which way do you think it's going to shift? Think about it in your mind. Make a prediction right now. All right, we'll lock it in. There's an increase in consumer spending. So you said that aggregate demand was going to shift to the right and you're correct. OK, when aggregate demand shifts to the right, well, what happens? Price level is going to increase and quantity or output is also going to increase. The more we demand, price level is going to increase because of demand pull inflation. And then suppliers are going to be willing to supply more because the price of the good that they can charge in the market is going to be higher. All right. So our output is also going to increase. But there's something else you can learn from this, not just price level and output. But we can learn a little bit about employment level as well. And if you think about it, we can also learn a little bit about wages. So let's think about this. In the short run, we know wages are sticky, so we're going to ignore wages. But typically, wages and price levels kind of rise together. Just price level will always outpace the increase of wages because of contract negotiations, things like that. However, we do learn about our employment rate. And we can learn that from the horizontal axis or our output level. If we know that where the LRAS intersects with our horizontal axis or where it says Q sub Y currently on your screen, that that is full employment. So that means that the four to six percent of our nation's labor force is currently unemployed. And we're OK with that because that's natural. But if our output increases, well, how do we increase output? In order for you to increase output, you need to add variable inputs to increase output. That means you need to hire more workers. So it's safe to say that if output goes up and we're producing beyond, in this case, Q1 is beyond where QI is, and that's full employment, it's safe to say that at Q1, the unemployment rate is below 4%. You could be at 2% unemployment because how else can you produce that Okay, and so we can learn a couple things. You can learn about four things about the economy at any given time looking at an aggregates model. Again, wages, you need to understand more about long run adjustment and things like that. We'll get to that. But for right now, focus on the big three. Price level, we can learn from the vertical axis. We can learn about output or real GDP on the horizontal axis. And then we can learn about unemployment based upon where our current production level is in comparison to the long run aggregate supply curve. If output goes up, unemployment goes down. They have an inverse relationship. In order for us to produce more, we need to hire more people. Therefore, the unemployment rate would decrease. Okay, I'm going to move on here. Practice, you guys can do these on your own. You have these PowerPoints. Okay, so now let's talk about gaps. Okay, in order for us, there he is, the GOAT. Okay, uh, in order for us to talk about gaps, we need to understand a couple things. First, the economy can only be in one place at any given time, okay? And there's three possible options. We can be in long run macroeconomic equilibrium, which means that we are producing at our potential. We can be in a recessionary gap, which means that we have high levels of unemployment and lower price level, right? I refer to those things as symptoms, right? We typically think of recessions as really, really bad and that our economy is sick. So I call them symptoms of a recession, which is be high levels of unemployment and lower price level. Uh, or lower wages rather. Uh, and then we could be in an inflationary gap, which means that we have a bit of inflation and we're technically kind of overemployed, right? We've hired too many people or resource prices are heating up. So let's look at this. On the left, we have our PPC curve. And on the right, we have our business cycle. And if you remember these, we talked about these a lot. And we know that if we look at our PPC curve or the production's possibilities curve, if you look at the inner red ring, the inner red ring represents full employment. This is how we initially taught it to you. There was only one outer ring. And I said, OK, if we employ all of our resources, we are going to produce on that red ring. 
because we hadn't really introduced the idea of, um, you know, uh, excess capacity. We hadn't re I introduced the idea that there is a natural rate of unemployment yet. So it was easier for us to say, okay, if everything is employed, all of our resources are currently being utilized property, we can produce any two combination of goods on this curve. Well, now we need to know that technically four to six percent of our populace being unemployed or our labor force rather being unemployed at any given time is natural. So what happens if we're our unemployment level is below that 4%. So if we had 0% unemployment, which means every person in the labor force is currently working and no one is looking for a job, right? Everything we talk about having all the time, what does that look like? And so that's going to give us an additional ring, right? And then that's it. Like there's nothing else you can do past that except for maybe robots can produce everything at a greater rate. All right. So let's look at these examples here. So the first thing that we can look at is the first spot we can be in is we can be in a recessionary gap, which means that we're producing to the left of the long run aggregate supply curve. In this case, in our production's possibilities curve, we are inside of our full employment red ring. And if you look at the business cycle, we're here at the bottom of the trough, right? Anytime that we go below this black line, which that linear curve represents an increase in real GDP over time at full employment, Okay, and then the red ring represents the ebbs and flows of the economy Okay, with the kind of short run um, instances uh, in our state of the macro economy. All right, that kind of lets us know where we're at. So if you look at the business cycle, the bottom of the trough, that's our recessionary gap inside the red ring. Okay, in our production's possibilities curve, it's a recessionary gap. So the next thing we're going to talk about is, well, at full employment. And we looked at this. This is long run macroeconomic equilibrium. At full employment, we are on the outer, or excuse me, the inner red ring on a production's possibilities curve. And we are what? We are along the line, right, of full employment in terms of our business cycle. And then that leaves us finally with an inflationary gap. Now, if we are anywhere below the natural rate of unemployment, so below that 4% mark in reality, but in terms of for theory purposes in, in our class, if we're below 5%, you're going to see a bit of an inflationary gap. So if we see this here, we're below that 5%. Resource prices are heating up. Things get more expensive. We're going to be just inside our maximum capacity on our production's possibilities curve. And then on our business cycle, we're going to be at that peak, right? At, at the top there showing an increase in weight, uh, an increase in prices. Okay? So remember, the economy can only be in one of three places at any given time. So let's look at some examples here. Okay, so if the government increases its spending, what's going to happen to price level and output? Well, we know government spending is a component of GDP, and therefore, if government spending increases, our aggregate demand is going to increase with it. So when you said that in your head just now, give yourself a high five. You did a great job. All right. So uh, bonus question to you is, is if government spending increases, what happens to the rate of unemployment while looking at this graph? If you said that unemployment decreased, you are correct. What type of gap is this? We know that price level increased. We know that we're producing a quantity that is beyond our potential. This is an inflationary gap. Okay. There we have it. That's an inflationary gap. Now, in your notes at home, I highly advise you writing these down, you drawing these graphs in class uh, down uh, at home. If you don't do it, we'll cover it in class, but this is what I'm gonna be starting class with. I'm gonna start with these graphs. I'm gonna ask you to tell me what they are and, and I'm, you know, if we're gonna kind of go from there. So an inflationary gap is anytime that our equilibrium point is to the right of long run aggregate supply. Okay, so now here we go. Here's another example. This is the self, Fulfilling prophecy, if you will, right? Everyone's talking about a recession coming, recession, recession, recession. People think a recession is coming. And then what do they do? They stop spending. So if consumer spending falls out of nowhere, what's going to happen? Well, we know that consumer spending is a component of aggregate demand. And therefore, aggregate demand is going to decrease. Well, if aggregate demand decreases, what happens to price level? Well, price level decreases. And so does output. It's not necessarily a good thing. The bonus question for you is this, what happens to our unemployment rate? If you said that unemployment is going to increase, you're correct. 
Prices fall, demand has fallen. We don't need people to work. You know, people who work in food services, I'm not going to name names, specifically at Cracker Barrel, you're probably going to be laid off because people aren't going to be coming to buy to buy lunch or dinner at your store because their spending habits have changed. Okay, that's only a joke. Please don't take that personally. So this is a recessionary gap. Okay. We now have the two symptoms of a recession. We have high levels of unemployment and we have low price level. Okay. And, and when this happens, we are typically in a recession. We spending is falling. We need to kind of kickstart the economy uh, to get us spending again. The next one. Now, those are our aggregate demand uh, looks. Let's see what happens to aggregate supply. What if there's a negative supply shock of oil? What happens to price level and output? We've talked about this in class. Okay, this is the 1970s. Uh, we had the, what? We had the oil embargo. So you're going to see aggregate supply is going to shift to the left. And this is the worst case scenario for an economy. Okay, is a negative supply shock, uh, a pandemic, if you will. Um, something that is going to have a negative impact uh, on our aggregate supply that's going to be more than just a, a tiny little short run instance. It's not like just a blip. It's not the, you know, the ever given getting stuck in the Suez Canal. This is a legitimate shock. Okay. So what happens? We're going to see aggregate supply is going to shift to the left. It's going to both increase price level and decrease output. So here's that bonus question again. The bonus question is, well, what now is happening? to unemployment. When you said to yourself, well, we know the output goes down, we don't need as many people to produce those goods, so unemployment's going to increase, you are correct. But this is the first time we're gonna see this. If we go back, if we go back to our recessionary gap, well, when aggregate demand decreased, we saw price level go down and output go down. And when aggregate demand increased, well, we saw price level go up and output go up. So there is that direct relationship, both when aggregate demand changes, price level and quantity typically move together, right? They travel together when it comes to aggregate demand. But when we get to aggregate supply, it's a whole new ball game. Okay? When aggregate supply shifts to the left, we're going to see both an increase in price level and a decrease in output. And this is the word that I've been using in class, right? Stagflation. It's a stagnant economy, right? Because we have high prices, people aren't working, but people are still buying goods. So think about that. People are losing their jobs, but we're still buying stuff because we're afraid things might run out or, or purchasing uh, habits have changed, whatever it might be. So that increase in purchasing goods is driving up prices through demand pull inflation. Meanwhile, there are still layers of people in the economy who are not working and losing their jobs. So we both have high rates of unemployment and inflated prices. Okay. And this is something that we're kind of seeing right now. It's just, we're not seeing it at the same rate as we did in the seventies. Okay. Uh, and so this is the worst case scenario. And the reason why I say that is because the next thing we're going to talk about is how do we fix these gaps? And anytime we interfere into the economy to fix these gaps, whether that's through government action, okay, in fiscal policy or Federal Reserve action in monetary policy, anytime you interfere into the market, there is a trade off, there's an opportunity cost. And so Typically, the cost is, well, if we fix unemployment, you're going to get a little inflation. And if you're going to fix inflation, you're going to get a little unemployment. Okay. And so, well, these things, they have an impact and people in, the, in positions of power have to make decisions. Which one are we going to fix? And the stagflated economy, there's no winner. There really isn't a winner because one thing is going to get worse and you have to make the choice. Are right, prices going to get worse or are more people losing their job? And if you're a politician, I don't know, how, do you, how would you make that decision, okay? All right, so with that being said, I am going to, I think I might stop it here. No, nope, we'll do long run adjustment and then I will stop the video, okay? So what happens in the long run? Understand this, for a really, really long time, prior to the Great Depression, we believed that not interfering in the economy, don't do anything, everything's going to work out in the long run, right? Like everything's going to come back in the long run. 
And for a really, really long time, this made sense. And I'm going to explain how this makes sense. Okay, so let's look at this. If consumer spending increases, what is going to happen in the short run? Well, if we know that consumer spending increases, aggregate demand is going to shift to the right. Our price level is going to increase and our output will also increase. If output increases, then unemployment goes down. This is all good things. But now we're in an inflationary gap, right? And if you look at our business model, we're here at a peak. Like things are great. We're flying high. Okay, we, we've hit a peak. But in the long run, what's going to happen, right? Well, we have inflation, which means that prices are going to increase. And Mr. McSweeney told me that when I'm at work and I'm in the, the real world, if prices increase and there's inflation, I need to ask my job or for a cost of living increase or a cost of living adjustment. And you should, and you will, and so will other people. And what happens? These businesses are gonna grant you these cost of living increases, and then they're gonna increase their prices on their products to compensate for the increase in your pay. And that's gonna to lead to a further increase in prices. So we have that price spiraling effect, right? Where we're gonna constantly increase prices. But if we look at it on our long run aggregate supply curve, what's gonna happen? Well, when you negotiate for higher wages and things get more expensive, well, people are gonna buy less because I'm gonna supply less. If the cost of production increases for me and I'm one company out of thousands, hundreds of thousands in the country, and we have tons of people asking for cost of living adjustments, and we all increase, or half of us even say yes, prices are going to increase, and we're going to be able to. We're not going to be able to supply as much, and so as a consumer, you're going to end up paying more, and we're going to supply less, which means some people are going to end up losing their jobs. Some people who aren't as efficient at their job as you are, your company says, okay, I'll give you the pay raise, but then maybe somebody else or two other people in the company who aren't very good at their job have to go as a result. And this is the reality of it, right? This is the reality of the market. Remember, in the beginning of the year, I told you markets don't care about people or feelings. They care about efficiency, and that's efficient. Okay, you want more money? Great, we'll pay you more money. You'll command more responsibility. You're going to have to continue or increase your production because now we have to get rid of other people in order to keep you on. And that's a, that's a decision that a company is willing to make, and every company has to make this decision. So don't ever feel bad. Those people may be, may be better suited in other areas of the industry, okay? And so when we look at this, well, what happens? Now, in the long run, after that adjustment period, after we all ask for new wages, aggregate supply is gonna to shift to the left because wages are a cost of production, and that's gonna bring us back to long-run macroeconomic equilibrium. Long-run adjustment is wage adjustment, guys. If you have a recessionary gap, what happens? Let's look at it. I think this is it. Yeah. Okay. So if consumer spending decreases and now we have a recessionary gap, what is the wage adjustment? Well, this is the unfortunateness of it. And we talked about it a little bit in one of the classes today. You work as a waiter or waitress, you deli deliver pizzas, whatever it might be. If spending decreases and we hit a recession. The first thing that goes is people stop spending money on food services. And as a high school kid or a college kid, this is your typical number one source of income. These are low skill, excuse me. Uh, yeah, no, low skill jobs that you guys can fill. Uh, your bosses can be flexible because there's a lot of kids that need work. And so you can kind of plug and play and it all works out. It's a great thing. But if people stop going to your establishment and stop buying, and you've experienced this with the coronavirus pandemic, there's no work. And even though the boss doesn't want to let you go, they might say, hey, would you take less hours? Maybe we take less pay. So maybe the long run adjustment in this case is that wages don't decrease per person per se, but the overall wage that companies pay to employees is going to decrease because employees are going to be laid off. Sorry, I, I don't have work for you. I, I can't pay you. You can't come in anymore. And what happens? As wages decrease, what should happen is that the cost of production decreases. So we should technically produce more. And I say what should happen because that's how it worked until the Great Depression. We went about 10 years, and aggregate demand had just fallen off a cliff, and nobody could buy anything. So even though there were less wages and the cost of production decreased, you can't increase production of goods that 
no one can buy now, they're not going to be able to buy it later if they're not making any money. And so because of the Great Depression, we opened Pandora's box and we intervened into markets and we started using policy. Right? And we'll talk about that in class. So thank you for watching. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to email me uh, or we can talk about it in class. Uh, and I will see you guys in school. Have a good night. Thank you.